cross comes in. White with the header. And here comes Whitehead. It's gold for Great Britain. Hi everyone and welcome to Track and Ball Podcast with myself, Richard Whitehead. My guest today, wow. Today, she literally is somebody that's on the rise. She's an Olympic athlete. She's a British champion. In her event since 2011, she has ruled the UK. She is living and working athlete. She's on the Athlete Commission. Uh, she's passionate about performance sport. And today we have the one and only Holly Bradshaw. I get it right. Uh, UK's uh, po- pole vault queen. Hi, Holly. How are you? How's everything going? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, things are going. Things are going well. Talk, talk to me first about um, obviously the environment at, at the moment. Obviously, pandemic, COVID. You've had a really challenging couple of weeks. Uh, talk about that coming back from the Europeans and uh, obviously not having to train, not being able to train. Yeah, it was initially really frustrating because I just feel like the last year I've spent just being so diligent, like to not catch COVID, you know, I've pretty much just stayed in my house, only left to train, been super cautious, hand sanitizing every minute and then to come home and, you know, I I didn't feel great. Um, I had like a bit of a cough and I thought, oh, maybe sometimes in an off season, I get a bit of an emotional come down anyway. So I might get a bit sick, you know, I'm in, I'm in my off season. I might be having a few treats here and there, KFC, Domino's, sometimes I get a bit sick. <laughs> right, I'm making notes because I'm definitely going to tell your coach that on your off time, you like a lot of junk food. Is because I knows. yeah, he knows, does it? I'm I'm the same though. I'm the same when I when I have a real intense training load and then have an easy week. My immune system takes a real hit, and I do everything to like you say be diligent around that. So up my vitamin C, uh, probiotics, everything, but I still seem to get it. So it must be something to do with the the training effect and actually not being at the track. Yeah, I think I I tend to get it quite often in an off season. It's just, I think it's more to do with like your emotional release. And, you know, I'm so focused a lot of the year. I'm in a massive routine training. My diet is super clean. I'm so like clear and focused on what I want to achieve. And then in my off season, I just, I don't know, the whole, like the pressure and everything just is released. And I just sometimes come down with a cold. It happens quite a lot. So I just thought that's what I had. I was like, oh, I've got a cough, my usual illness. But because of COVID, I feel like everyone's on edge. Everyone's like, Mm -hmm. oh, I've got a bit of a tickly uh, throat. Is it COVID? And I mean, I don't know about you, but I was like that the whole of last year. And any time I had a little bit of a cough, a little bit of a sneeze, I was like, oh, my God, have I got it? So I kind of went and got a test and then it came up positive. I was literally so gutted. I was like, this is a nightmare. And you're um, in great shape at the moment. And before that, you were in great shape as well. Um, do you think it was a knockback getting COVID or do you think this has been a time to like frame your training or really reassess how you're going to move forward towards the summer? Yeah, I think it was a blessing in disguise. And initially, I was, the reason why I was gutted is my, I mean, I don't do a very um, aerobically enduring event. Pole vault is not very demanding on my lungs and I'm on the verge of being asthmatic. So when I caught COVID, my, my big worry was, how is this going to affect like me coming back? Am I going to be super unfit? Am I, am I going to be struggling with my lungs? And the first week of training, Scott put in a lot of bike sessions, a lot of tests to kind of test where I was at. And I was absolutely fine. And thankfully, you know, I've come back and I'm still in great shape. And I think the reason why it's a blessing in disguise is I don't know about you, Rich, but unless I'm forced into rest with like an injury or illness, I struggle just sitting at home. I just like, oh, I could be at the track. I could be getting better. I could be getting stronger. And I think COVID meant I was out for two weeks. It just meant I was able to recover. I was struggling with a bit of a niggle indoors, uh, which wasn't stopping me, but I, 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 you know, I needed to get it sorted. And the two weeks allowed me to just rest and get my, like my body sorted. So moving away from COVID now, um, I want to look at your, your career and, um, what, what do you say your favorite moment is so far? Um, 
I do get asked this a lot and I think it like surprises some people which my favorite moment is because I've been to multiple worlds and Olympics but for me it was in 2018 when I won the bronze medal in the European outdoors in Berlin and it just it like resonates with me a bit that medal because it was my first um, outdoor medal um, and a lot of people throughout my career have said you know she's an indoor specialist she never competes well outdoors you know even even after finishing four fifths sixth in world champs and olympics you know i was still branded and in like um, an indoor specialist so when i kind of won that medal it was a big not like relief but it was a bit of a a point to prove and i i almost you know i fell out of love with the sport um a bit in 2017 just a build up of injuries and you know wanting to prove myself to people and um wanting to prove like myself to myself and 2017 was really difficult I was giving myself a hard time and then I really tried hard for six months to really change my outlook and really focus on myself and focus on why am I doing this sport I want to do it for the right reasons because I love it and it was just a massive breakthrough and I just fell back in love with the sport in 2018 and to finish that season with that medal was just really special. Is that when you started to work with Sarah Cecil? Did you start to work with her on and um, and kind of get a real focus about what you wanted out of the sport again? Or Yeah, so I've been working with Sarah Cecil since 2013. Um, she was, when I first started, oh, okay. yeah, when I first started getting my injuries back in 2013, I was pointed in her direction and I was a bit sceptical of sports psychology and knowing what I do now and how passionate I am about sports psychology, it seems weird that back then I was really skeptical, but it was her that, you know, I saw her and I just felt she was incredible. You know, she's not a typical, I don't think she's a typical sports psychologist that kind of sits there and not preaches, but is very methodical, very, we're doing this, we're doing that. She, I just feel like I'm sat having a conversation with her and we just get places and I've worked with her now since 2013 and, you know, we speak every, every week, every couple of months. And, um, yeah, I, I, she's been a massive, a massive contributor in that. And she really helped me during 2018 to change my philosophy as a person. And that's important. I, um, so I can share a Sarah Cecil story as well. I, um, I broke one of my running blades in 2011 in Auckland. And I was just like, my head was like going, I've got to kind of put these legs on and then run at 20 miles an hour. What happens if it just breaks again? And so we had, mm. me and Sarah had conversations when I was out in New Zealand and she definitely helped me through the process of kind of getting over that mental block. And since then I've used some of the techniques when I've either broke blades or fallen over. So there definitely is a massive play for sports psychology, but also investigate how it actually works for yourself. And do you find that you you use practitioners in lots of different ways in your team? Yeah, I think I've got quite a big team. Um, you know, I've got, you know, a, a couple of physiotherapists, a massage therapist, sports psychologist, someone that I call on for like nutrition and supplement advice. I, I would say like, you know, there's 20 people in my team and I'm... I really like personal relationships and every single person that I consider, you know, a part of my interdisciplinary team, I lean on, you know, we're not, it's not, it's not friends because we're not friends, but I like to be able to like lean on them, um, seek their advice, you know, just almost them to be a sounding board. And Rob Miller, my SNC coach, he he's very much like that. We'll just chat about lots of different rubbish and then we'll get down to business and he'll give me tips on like my cleans. And I think it's really important for me to have that personal element, almost like friendship, because and that's how I get the best out of myself. Yeah, definitely. And those relatable relationships, I think are really important. I I love pole vault. Um, I'm from a gymnastic background. So I did gymnastics when I was younger. And I think obviously training is something that, that people look at as being such so dynamic. You've got so many different aspects to your, your event. And at the moment, there's a real buzz around uh, pole vault, nationally, internationally. Why do you think that is? And do you think it's players across not just the men's but also the women's events are so strong so competitive and you're part of that yeah I think internationally especially on the men's side it's just 
been seen as a really cool event. Um, you know, pole vault is, especially on the female side, is very new. It only came as the Olympics in 2000. So the exciting thing about women's pole vault is the depth and it's just, you know, creeping up every, every year. Like last year, um, I still think 2019 was last year, not last year, the year before when I went to the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crazy when i went to the world i finished <laughs> finished fourth with 480 which has won a medal at every other majors and i'm not one of those athletes that's bitter about that i'm not like uh, i would have won a medal at any other majors but that's just to show you how much pole vault's progressing like and that's just great for the event and then you've got people like Mondo and Reno who are just really good ambassadors for the sport, making it really cool, getting more exposure because they're so cool. And I think that's just what's make, putting Paul Bot on the map. And I definitely feel like it's growing in the UK. It just still needs a bit more exposure. Yeah. Seeing's believing definitely and getting the, um, uh, getting TV uh, involved in that is, is key to that. Uh, you did a, an event, uh, was it in Paris recently? um how was that that was on was it on the street somewhere uh, it looks awesome yeah i did one in the summer in lausanne which was really cool that was like men and lausanne. women's vault and then the two indoor meets the two indoor meets the, that were broadcast on eurosport in france renault's meet and another one i think it's just the fact that you've got two hours of pole vault only it's just great for the event and so many people saw it and all you need is you know a six eight year old to, to watch that and be like i want to do that and that's just how the event grows yeah yeah definitely and and also to be able to see every vault not just the key vault or the winning vault that one of my big gripes around track and field especially field is that you'll see one throw in the javelin or you'll see three jumps out of the six the broadcasters really need to buy into the athletes and the athletes want the public to be able to see the process of get, getting to those heights. Um, and I know how hard you work and you want to, you want to show everybody, not just the, your, your uh, progress in your hearts, you want them to see how you get there as well. Yeah, I think that's a massive bugbear of, of me and myself as well is pole vault and any field event, it's, it is, it's, it's a show in its own right. And, you know, when you're watching the hundred meters, you're watching them, you know, get into their blocks, you're watching the build up. You, they're in the, they're in the set position off they go. Oh, what's happening. And you don't get that in the pole vault. You might just get, Oh, here's Holly. She finished third. Here's her best jump of the day. It's boring. Like when I'm watching athletics and I'm watching the long jump, I'm like, Oh, that's boring. I don't want to see someone that someone's jump where they jumped it half an hour ago. Like pole vault, you, you've got people tussling back and forward, you know, Oh, they're, they're on the same bar. If they clear, that they go into the bronze medal position or they're going to like none of the stories told in pole vault and it's just a vicious circle because every time they just show one jump people are like that was boring pole vault's boring whereas on the on where they stream the pole vault from start to finish i know it i know it's really hard to do and that's why they don't do it but there needs to be a better way to show the whole thing because that's what's exciting about it it's like an unfolding story mm. There's definitely there's definitely means in media whether it's split screen or whether it's you you cut back to jumps or but they need to uh, show everything. I travel with a lot of equipment, so prosthetics wise, but not as much as you. How hard can you explain yeah. to the listeners and viewers how hard it is to transport a pole all the way across the world? So obviously you were in South Africa last year when I was there. Was it last year or the year before? <laughs> um, and uh, I know how hard it, took, it was for you to get your poles to South Africa. How hard, how hard is it to travel your equipment? Oh, God, it's literally the bane of my life. And um, I actually travelled to the Europeans without my poles because they went straight from France. And people who moan about travel who don't have to carry poles or equipment i'm just like you have it so easy and it's it is just super stressful like you don't know whether they're going to get on the fly um so you're kind of waiting at the other end are they going to come out sometimes it can take hours for them to transport the poles just to the belt um the amount of times i've rocked up to the airport and someone's like oh no we don't carry them I flew with you last week on this very aircraft. I know you carry the poles. It's just a constant like battle with them. And, you know, you've just got to think about, oh, how close is the um, car park to where I'm going to drop the poles off? Because obviously they weigh 30 kg. How long am I going to have to carry these poles for? It's just a constant thing. And 
as a pole vaulter, it's, it's what you know and it's what you're used to, so you just get on with it. But when you strip it back and think how annoying it is, it, it is annoying. Like in COVID, especially, you know, when with, if you take COVID out of it, there's maybe five or six airlines that will travel around Europe that carry poles. Well, now it's COVID, there's one or two. So this indoor season, I couldn't get to half my meets because I literally couldn't get my poles there on a flight. So it's just a massive stress ball. And can you explain to the um, listeners and viewers about how important it is that you've got your own equipment as well? You don't, you don't borrow somebody else's or it's very specific to you, isn't it? Which I didn't Yeah. Realize. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I had absolutely like for like poles at a venue, I potentially could jump on them, but my poles are very specific to me. You know, there's four or five different brands of poles to start with. And then, you know, I weigh 67 kg and I'm five nine tall. Well, one of my competitors might weigh 60 kg and is five foot one. There's no way we could take the same poles. Um, it's very specific to the way you jump, how heavy you are, how fast you are into takeoff, how tall you are, and it's just impossible to borrow someone else's poles, really. So you have to travel with your own. When speaking with your coach, one of the things he did say is, you know a lot more about poles. <laughs> is that true? Is that something that Scott brought to the party, his his knowledge around equipment? Yeah, I mean, as a youngster, um, I was just a bit head in the clouds. My coach, my other coach, which I left after 2012, he would just use this pole, go back to this meters on the runway and run in, do your thing. And it's funny, really, because, um, you know, there was me and another girl. We were quite young and innocent and we used to spray paint our poles. So one day, one afternoon, we spent hours. One was the pink and green and then the other one was yellow and purple. And 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 that's how I would take a pole. So my, my coach in the competition would be like, <laughs> yeah, that's how untechnical it was. It would be go take the purple and yellow or go take the blue and green. And actually one competition, I really messed up because stupidly there's a purple and yellow and a very different pole is the yellow and purple, the same colors, but the other way around. And I picked up the wrong one. So when I, <laughs> yeah, when I, <laughs> ridiculous. And when I, when I came to Scott, he was like, we are not doing this. You need to learn. The, the flex of the pole, how long it is and stuff like this. And he very, he made it very methodical, which I was really grateful for because as a professional athlete, you can't just be like, go take the purple pole. It's just ridiculous, really. No. I've, <laughs> I've once, and I've not told anybody this, but I've once. So on my running feet, I have got left and right spikes on the bottom of my running feet. And I've raced <laughs> with them the wrong way around before. <laughs> <laughs> which which doesn't help when you go around a bend because you've yeah. got spikes in the different positions and I was like so I ran I finished and Keith my coach said yeah that was a little bit indifferent your time was okay but it was a, there was just something wrong and I don't actually think I ever told him that I don't got my spikes on the wrong way around I felt a right That's plonker so and first time I've First time I've ever told anybody. So don't tell anybody else, right? <laughs> <laughs> Promise. Promise. So your 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 yeah, yeah, your your coach, Scott, how has he changed your outlook um as a professional woman and professional athlete moving forwards? And has that relationship continued to develop? Yeah, so I think um I came to him at uh, like 20 years old and now I'm 29 so I've changed a lot throughout that time but I think he just made me he just educated me more about the event back in 2012 um I like I said I was just kind of like head in the clouds just riding the kind of wave of youth and just not really knowing what I'm doing not being I hadn't been taught properly and I think when I came to him he was shocked at how little I actually knew um with relative to how high I'd actually jumped. So the first like four or five years was all education. It was, you know, this is the way I work. You need to be organized, you need to be on time for training, kind of the no stone unturned approach. And that's just the way I am now. I'm so organized. When I'm going into a competition, you you better believe that I'm ready and I've I've not left anything to chance. Everything is kind of methodically put in place for me to do my best. And I think 
yeah, the first like five, six years was all about education. And then now it's like more of a partnership where we bounce ideas off each other. I know a lot more about the event now. So pretty much in a session, I'll, I'll do the jump and I'll come off the bed and I'll be like, I think I was a bit low at takeoff and maybe I need to swing faster. And he'll be like, yeah, you need to swing fast to get taller at takeoff. So we're very much aligned now. And it's, we're there as like a supporting network for each other, really. And we're on this journey together as a team because he's kind of taught me everything he knows and now we learn stuff together and um we're just kind of yeah in this you know we're nine years deep into a relationship which is super strong super successful and it's definitely been a big learning curve for me but i think now it's more of a partnership rather than teacher student and are you on track for where you should be um has there been those curveballs in that journey that you've had to reset yeah, I mean, um, coming out of, you know, four years into to London Olympics, I was a young, um, young athlete, under-conditioned. And then, you know, when I started properly training as an athlete, when I, when I came to Scott, there was a lot of adversity we had to face. You know, my body, you know, because I hadn't been conditioned for the four years, but I had jumped super high, my body just started to break and Achilles injuries, back surgeries, knee surgeries. And we faced a really tough five year period where we had to navigate some real rubbish thrown at us. And it just kind of made us stronger, made us unite. And I think that's part of why we're so close as a partnership is because we've have had to navigate a load of rubbish together. But um, yeah, I feel like we're really strong and all that stuff has, has been really useful and helpful in, in where we are now. And I, I honestly don't think I could be in any better shape going into Tokyo. You know, had the Olympics been last year, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have been ready and, and I potentially wouldn't have been in a better place to win a medal. Whereas now, coming off the back of the indoor season, everything I've been working on for the last 10 years has all just come together and I'm, I'm in a great place. What are your Tokyo aspirations? What are your, what's your target? So pole vault's a funny one. Um, you can be world lead all year, but because there's so many variables that play in pole vault, it's, it's quite, you know, even if I jump in 20 centimeters higher than everyone, it's absolutely not guaranteed that I'll win. And the European indoors just shows you that, you know, I was definitely favorite and finished third. And that's the great thing about pole vault. So, you know, there's eight, six to six to eight girls that can win a medal. And I'm definitely one of them. And I've just, my aspirations is to deliver our medal winning performance on the day of Tokyo and hope it's enough to snatch one of those medals. But it, if I, if it's kind of if I finish fourth, but I've still delivered a medal winning performance, I can be I can be at peace with that. You've kind of answered this question anyway. What does success look like for you going into the games? Have you got those markers that you really look look for? Yeah, we do have markers. Um, you know, pole vault isn't all. A lot of people think it's just about feel and. The thing that frustrates me about pole vault is, I, d I don't know whether it's like this for you, but, you know, if you're hitting a 50 metre, you know, in 100 metres, if you're hitting a 60 metre time, it kind of equates to such and such a time in the 100. You know, we have that in pole vault. If you are, can grip this high, coming in this fast on a pole, um, you're going to jump this bar. And for me, the markers are on, you know, if I, I can get 8.5, 8.6 on the run, capping out a 450 pole, um, that's pretty much guaranteed like a, a 90 jump on, on a given day. So I, I'm well capable and on target to do that. So um, yeah, those are the kind of the markers we look for and I'm in, I'm in shape to do that. So yeah. So you have to be conditioned for the certain kind of jump that you'll do and then the equipment then needs to be there for you to do that. Yeah, exactly. So for me, um, yeah, yeah, it is. There's so many variables. Like, and even and even then you're not guaranteed. Like our aims are to run 8.5 on the run. So for I'll do a speed block where I do um, fly in 20s. I'll do over speed and hopefully then that translates 8.5 on the run. Um, I want to be hitting like a, a 90 plus one RM in the clean. I want to be benching, you know, 75 plus. There are markers and that means, you know, that I'm strong. And then that, that almost tells coach that I'm, I'm in good shape and then I just need to put that on the runway and execute a good technical jump, which, you know, isn't an easy thing to do. It's not guaranteed, but there's a couple of cues that I've unlocked recently, which are really helping me um, execute a good jump. And outside of training, what, what stimulates you to be the best person that you, 
you can be. It's not all. You can't be all kind of focused for pole vault, surely. No, no. Um, I always say this to athletes. I don't know whether you get this, but young athletes, they're like, oh, I need to train. I need to train full time and then I need to recover. I can't do anything else. And I don't know. I'm not like that. I'm like, you know, I train for two, three hours of the day, sleep for 10 of those. What am I going to do with the rest of my day? Like that's over 10 hours. And for me, a big passion is sports psychology. I'm doing an MSc. So a lot of uni work. I love coffee. Um, so make a couple of coffees a day. I'm really big into like my latte art, so me too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely about that. Nice. And then, obviously, yeah, I'm on the athlete commission, and then we've set up a bit of a mentoring thing. There's me, Adam Jamili, Laura Waitman, Tom Bosworth, Sophie McKinna, Emily Diamond. We're all doing um, this athlete mentoring for 16, 17, 18 year old athletes, just to try and help them um, kind of bridge the gap from junior to senior. That's awesome. And I've heard you're quite good at PowerPoint presentations. Is it Canva? I love Canva. I've heard oh. There's a program. <laughs> I've heard that everything is done in this program called Canva. Is that true? Honestly, I've got Canva open Why is right that? now. And how did you find it? <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Come on, you need to educate us. You need to educate myself or the viewers and listeners what Canva is. So it's like, I almost describe it as like a platform where there's so many templates of Instagram story, posters, infographics, all stuff like that. And I found it because I was doing a uni PowerPoint, um, a PowerPoint presentation. I thought PowerPoint is rubbish. Like I'm very much, I'm not a creative person, but things need to look pretty. And PowerPoint just doesn't cut it for me. So I found this camera and I thought, what is this? Just like me. <laughs> honestly it's life-changing <laughs> i need to get on it i need to get on you it I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch it as soon as we finish i'm going to get on canva and um is that is that something that you look to because obviously that's part of who you are now with your your presentation and who you are you um talking to a coach as i did uh, before we we're talking he says you've grown as a person do you think you're always Add, looking to add value to who you are and then be a better person to be a better athlete? Yeah, definitely. I think um, that's just the nature of who I am. You know, everything's compared against myself. You know, I have a training diary and constantly I'll be looking, oh, I've got two, two RMs in the clean today. What did I do last time? How can I make it better? And I'm definitely like that in terms of my personality as well. I remember a couple of years ago, um, I was getting really jealous about like other athletes being able to compete when I was injured. And I just didn't like feeling jealous. Like it's not like they were performing. Uh, I wasn't jealous. They were performing well. It was just the fact that they were able to jump and I couldn't because I just had surgery and I listened to podcasts, read um, information on how to become not, not as jealous. And I'm always looking for ways like that, you know, um, that's just one example, but at any time I feel something that I don't want to feel, I, I just try and change it and like better myself. Yeah, track and ball podcast, that's what you need to be listening to and watching. <laughs> uh, Holly, uh, before we finish, we have 10 questions and these are random 10 questions and they might challenge you a little bit. Myself and Ellen, we're going to come up with them, but. Ellen's were too sensible and mine were too crazy, but these are the ones that we come up with. And the first question, nice and easy, I'm sure, I'm sure what your answer will be, is track or ball? That's not hard any... one, right? Really hard. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ball. <laughs> oh my goodness, you're killing me. <laughs> you're killing me. Second one, greatest accomplishment so far in life? Um, I think um, double Olympic finalist would be it. And I've heard you you had a proposal, didn't you? After after London. Was it after London? Mm -hmm. After London. That yeah. must be a, a big accomplishment, right, getting married. <laughs> Honestly. Or it might be, or might have <laughs> I just... I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to help you out here. 
It was like a couple of years ago, someone said, was talking about 2014 and 2014 was the year I got married. And I was like, nothing good happened in 2014. Like it was, it was a sucky year for me sport wise. Like I had back surgery, missed the Commonwealth. And I just was like, oh, what a rubbish year. And Paul was like, my husband, uh, we got married. I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Forgot about that. <laughs> That's an athlete for you. That's an athlete for you. Yeah. Next question. Do you believe in ghosts? No. No. No, me either. The person we had a minute ago did. <laughs> <laughs> what what's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Ooh. That's really hard. Mm. I don't know really. I'm I'm not really a risk taker. I'm more of a play it safe kind Changing of girl. Coaches or... that, no, that wasn't really a risk. <laughs> no offence to my old coach. Um, you just want to be actually, better. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I think one of the biggest risks was, um, I think back in 2018, um, I got dropped by Nike and I guess... I, I wanted to go, I wanted to put myself out there and be unsponsored. So instead of like rushing into a decision, I just took four months to myself, not going to sign anything, not going to rush into anything and just see what happens. And I guess at the time that felt like a bit of a risk. Uh, can you sing? Mm, my husband is the only person that's heard me sing and he <laughs> says I'm okay. <laughs> Okay. So, I, I medium, okay. um, maybe a little bit. If you bit. went to a karaoke, what would you sing? Ooh, maybe an ABBA song. I'm really into ABBA. When are you the happiest? <laughs> um, I think when I'm pole vaulting. Like, I know it's cheesy, but the feeling of a really good vault, there's nothing better. And what's the silliest thing you've ever got upset about? Hmm. <laughs> I get upset a lot. <laughs> um, Do you? Well, my husband's really good at winding me up. So, and like, I either get angry or upset and it tends to be more like upset because he's just wound me up. Um, and what does he wind you up? Why does he do that? Just, I think he just thinks it's funny. Like, I'm, I, I feel like my buttons are really easily pressed. So we'll like, we'll like be talking about, <laughs> we'll be talking about something then he'll like poke me and I really hate being poked. And then I'll just get so annoyed that I'll just like storm off. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> I know. Where do you see yourself in, where do you see yourself in 10 years time? Hmm. Well, I mean, I've always wanted to be a mother um, before I ever started pole vaulting. It's what I've always wanted. So I'd hope in 10 years time, like maybe like two or three kids settle down up north in Lancashire with my family. That'd be nice. Awesome. You'll be a great mum, by the way. Oh, thanks. Uh, how would you, how would your friends describe you? I think they'd describe me as sensible, but kind of, I don't know, like sensible, but kind of, I have like a side, a crazy side um, that only like a few people see. Um, yeah, I guess they'd, they'd say that. Crazy side. Oh. You need to tell us more. You can't just leave it like that. that <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You need to expand on I'm this not... now. This is these, these little nuggets. <laughs> Maybe you'll see it one day. So, so in other words, so when I'm down, when I'm down at the track, I'll start poking you. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and the last question: um, What's your greatest fear? Oh, I hate spiders. Grim. Like, I know that's a phobia, but honestly, oh, really? it's like my greatest fear. Spiders. Can't be doing with them. So you're in a you're in a hotel room ready to compete. 
your husband's not there, you've got nobody rooming with you, there's a massive spider in the bathroom, what do you do? Use the lobby bathroom. I'm not going in. <laughs> Great answer. Holly, thank you for your time. You're a star. Um, you've been very open and uh, good luck for the rest of the season. Uh, see you in Tokyo being successful, really pushing for one of those medals. Um, keep training hard. We're all rooting for you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Cross comes in. White with the header. One more on the run. And here comes Whitehead. It's gold for Great Britain. 